Well, friends, welcome to another True Tone Lounge, and today we have the honor of having Rock and Roll Hall of Fame member Elliot Easton from the Cars and uh, and the new Cars and Credence Clearwater Revisited, and uh, you know you have the Empty Hearts, and uh, wow, it's it's just an honor. I, I can't... the Tiki Gods <laughs> and the Tiki Gods. Yes, your guitar band. Yes, yes, I see them all all above you. Yeah, it's. That's right. You know the the cars tunes especially are are just still seen you know are heard all the time on on the radio and your guitar solos are so iconic, you know whether it's the rockabilly influence thing like on my best friend's girl, or the you know you know kind of more distorted parts on just what I needed or all, all these different guitar styles that you kind of have under your fingers and and really one of the great kind of pop guitar stylist of the 80s and beyond but you know you know we have to recognize that you know the those cars records had uh, a huge audience so honored so thank you Elliot for being for doing this well thank you for well, those amazingly kind words I feel very blessed you know we all started out as kids playing guitar and we all had the same hopes and dreams for most some of us. And yeah. I, I feel, I feel so lucky. I mean, I got to realize my childhood dreams, you know, and, and with those guys, we saw the top of the mountain together. And sometimes, sometimes it's almost like watching a movie about your own life. It's mm -hmm. just, I'm so grateful and so blessed and so happy that things worked out the way they did because there's so many people, so many kids took up guitar and had the same dream, you know, and, and, and you know, starting with, say, seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show and then to end up having Ringo play on your last record and, 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 and all the stuff in between, it's, it's miraculous. I don't know what, what kind of word to use for it, but uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Elliot, that's a beautiful way of 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 looking at it, you know, because I can tell that you have a a, a gratefulness, you know, for for the yeah. things you've been able to experience, and uh, you know, and of course we recognize, you know, the hard work and the talent and all the the other efforts, but the the gratefulness that you have, that's a very beautiful thing. So thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, thanks. It's you don't have to thank me. I mean, I come yeah. from pretty humble background you know, middle, lower middle class background and wash dishes to get my first guitar and, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just really, you know, I am grateful, you know, that, that, I, that I have a career and that, that I, I developed a style that people can recognize and that people like, still can like whistle my solos from, you know, from, from Cars records and stuff like that. That's incredible to me. That's it's like all I ever really wanted, you know. Yeah. And yeah. The rest of it all kind of the rest of it is sort of ancillary and falls into place, and all the amazing stuff that happens to you, like endorsements or signature model guitars, or you know, all 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 the incredible things that happen when you're a so-called rock star. Yeah. But you know, I can, I can look at it from the outside and go, man, this is unbelievable, and. Um, and, and, and I, I, I enjoy it very much. It's a good yeah. job. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think one of the things that was evident, you know, early early on in, uh, you know, see, seeing you in the in the guitar magazines in the '80s and being interviewed and such, and uh, you know, the photos of you with your spread, you know, of guitars, you know, which I mean, I think you know later on became kind of almost a, a rock guitar player cliche, but. Yeah, but with you, it was obvious that you really loved, you know, these guitars and you, you know, you were, you were purchasing vintage instruments and newer things yeah. and you'd be on the back cover with, you know, cause like Kramer had like the back cover guitar player locked up for years and, and you'd right. be on the back cover with your signature model and uh, right. yeah, right. just a, a real love of the guitar. Obsessed, uh, you know, as a kid, 
uh, I couldn't afford a, a good guitar, but I would I would take the bus. I, I grew up in, on the south shore of Long Island in a town called Massapequa. As a matter of fact, I went to school with the Baldwin brothers and Brian Setzer and Jerry Seinfeld, all Massapequa. <laughs> That's and insane. My, my, social, my social studies teacher was Alex Baldwin, yeah. their father. Um, but anyway, I, I was so crazy about guitars that I would take take the bus to, to Sam Ash in Huntington mm-hmm. or the Salt Grayson's in Freeport just to be near guitars, just to be around guitars. Right. And, you know, I, all I would leave with was brochures. And I would take these catalogs with me to school and I'd hide them inside my book. And so the teacher would think I was reading my textbook and I'd be studying my Gibson 66 Gibson catalog and stuff like that. Really just, I mean, I, I knew every model, model number, the model number of the faultless case, you know, the, the case cover. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, yes. So, so into it. And so if I, if I may, I'd love to tell you a story about kind of a, a neat kind of completing of the circle of that whole thing. Yes, please. So, there was this store in, in Freeport, Long Island called Grayson's. And it was owned by a guy named Bernie Grayson and his dad worked there who called Pop Grayson, who looked just like Louis Dombrowski from the Bowery Boys, the, the candy shop owner, the old man. Yeah. So we called, we called him Louis Dombrowski. But anyway, um, I, I was so obsessed with guitars. So I used to take the bus there and, and sweep up and like, and help the stock guy, Danny, uh, move boxes just to be near guitars and stuff like that. And if I got this job washing dishes and I ordered, this is 1971 I, or 70, I ordered a, a custom-made left-handed Fender Telecaster, my first one. And, uh, you know, at that time, it seemed like all my heroes were playing tellies, like Robbie Robertson and Jesse Davis and you know, Roy Buchanan and Clarence White, James Burton, just I had so many yeah. great telly players. So I wanted one that, and uh, I washed dishes to get it. And I would drive Bernie crazy. I'd call like every other day, is it in yet? Did, did my, like, like as though he wouldn't have called me when it came and he knew how crazed I was for it. And, and he's such a kind man and so patient. Uh, he took an old, Fender left-handed Jaguar in on, on a trade and it was hanging on his wall. Someone had sanded it and painted it with psychedelic paint and stuff. He said, Elliot, take this home with you and play this until your guitar comes in. And you can keep, take, keep this one with you until we get yours. And it was so kind, but also got me off his back. And <laughs> so, but, but the kindness of this guy, and he knew how, how crazy I was about guitars. So roll up. I, to 1979, and I'm at the NAM show when it was at the McCormick Place in Chicago. Yes. And uh, I'd already done the first album and Candy O, uh, and the cars were going along real good. And I'm standing at one of the booths in NAM, just chatting with someone. I look and I see Bernie Grayson. And so I, I gotta go, gotta go over and say hello to this guy. So I go over and I say, Bernie. My name is Elliot Easton. I don't know if you'll remember me, but I, I used to come to your store and, and just hang out and I was a left-handed kid. He, he stops me, he goes, and he grabs me. He, he goes, wait, you got to meet my wife. And he drags me over, he had tears in his eyes. He drags me over to his wife and he goes, this is the kid I always used to tell you about. And he had tears in his eyes and he was so happy that I had my career was going well and 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 everything was going good and it was such a warm moment and so it was like a direct link to my childhood obsession with this stuff and it continued and and showing you how you know it came true and i got to share that with these guys that i used to pester when it was just a dream right and it was such a right and it was, it was such a satisfying uh, nice moment that, that's a, a a beautiful moment what about so you have this this you know love and and you know obsession with the guitar when when you start actually having real money come in from from playing what was the first guitar you you bought you know where you you know kind of really you know blew a large sum of money on a guitar 
Oh boy. Um, I guess the first like large sum of money, you know, I, I needed guitars to work with and in the early days of the cars, all I had was two guitars. I had a Les Paul standard and just a garden variety Telecaster yeah. that I bought at Man in New York. And, um, but, but when we started, you know, and you know, when, when you're in a band and you sell records, you don't make money right away. It takes a little while for that all to catch up. Um, but when I, some money, I finally got some some real money. The first one I got was a guitar that a lot of a lot of people know about because it was a centerfold in Guitar World magazine, and it was a 1964 left-handed Burgundy Mist Stratocaster. Oh yes, I remember that centerfold. Yeah, you know, remember that? Yes. And this guitar, I'll tell you the story. Um, I got it from Larry Hendrickson, Axe in Hand. Yes. had it uh either that or then it went to ed selig and i got it but anyway i bought it it was i think twenty eight hundred dollars or something something like that but it was unplayed and it wasn't like sort of like you could call something unplayed but there was sort of proof the receipt came from an air force base a kid on an air force base ordered this guitar and had the receipt from the music store or even the time payments and, you know, you could see what happened. He was left-handed. He had to order it anyway, so he ordered it with the coolest custom color. And, and it was in a white Tolex case with the black leather ends that creaked when you opened it. The leather wasn't even broken in and it had the booklet hanging from the headstock and flat-wound strings had never been changed. And the frets were new and scratchy, they were new, hadn't, hadn't been sort of burnished by bending notes a lot yet. They weren't silky yet. It was a new guitar. Wow. So, <laughs> so uh, that was my, that was my first purchase. And uh, we still talk about that one. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you don't have that one anymore or do you still have it? Assume away. No, I, I don't have it anymore. Foolishly, so many guitars, you know, we all have stories of, uh, you know, seller remorse or the ones that got away and stuff. And yeah. I wish I still had it. It'd be a hundred thousand dollar guitar now, yeah. but um, I don't have it <laughs> anymore. Yeah. But I loved owning it. I loved playing. It. Yeah. Well, let's. Uh, there, you know, to, you know, on the subject of the cars, there, are, you know, a number of things I've, you know, become very curious about, and one is the uh, the the two record producers that you worked with you know kind of well i guess you had roy thomas baker and then you had mutt lang and two mm. you know very well known producers that have very identifiable styles and very mm. identifiable vocal sounds and and very identifiable identifiable ways in which they stack things and eq things and it was just uh, curious as to, because, I mean, of course, the cars didn't sound like Queen, you know, with Roy, nor did they sound like, you know, Def Leppard with, uh, you know, with Mutt Lang. But uh, or just, ACDC. Go ahead. No, I said or ACDC. Or know. ACDC. Right. But I was just wondering, uh, you know, kind of contrasting those, those two, you know, styles of producing and how, you know, because you were kind of... I don't know, you always got kind of put into the punk new wave thing, but you were kind of, you know, your your own thing and uh, you weren't really Queen or, or ACDC. And, and you know, you, you here you are with these producers, but I mean, obviously it worked well, but contrast the way those two producers worked. Okay, I'll try. Well, okay. first of all, a good producer, you, you know, just because they produce a queen or mutt produces a uh, Def Leppard or ACDC, a good producer, it wouldn't necessarily mean that you're going to sound like that group or that everything they do is going to sound the same. The job of a producer is to bring out the best in that group, right? right? So we heard Bohemian Rhapsody and and could and could hear the elements of it, you know, whether or not it was stylistically what anything we were going for, you couldn't help but marvel at like the sounds, the, yes. the stacked vocals and, and Roger Taylor's kick-ass drums and the rhythm section was really rocking and the guitars had great sounds and everything. So we had gotten signed to Elektra Records and this was a time when we were looking for a producer and Elektra uh, suggested Roy 
And uh, we we played we were playing this gig. It was a snowed out gig at Holy Trinity College in Worcester, Massachusetts, or something like that. And there were like twenty people in like in the gym or student union building. And um, our manager brought Roy to the gig, and there was like eight people there. And he loved the band. And he's he was like Roy's like a Monty Python character. He's like, Hello, my loves, and and he talks like that. He's really funny. And he said, how would you like to come away to England and make a record? Well, at, at, at George Martin's studio, Air. And that sounds pretty good to us. You know, I've just been collecting food stamps. Um, you know, that, sound, that sounds pretty good. You know, I, I'd never been further south than Washington, D.C. None of us had ever been anywhere. And, and so that was an amazing thing. But as far as stylistically... Until I'd worked with Mutt, I would have thought that Roy was like hyper technical and super exacting and super persnickety and, and particular and, you know, about perfection. But compared to Mutt, Roy is almost more of like an organic kind of rock and producer. And that's the truth, you know. So, so for Roy, I mean, he, he was so savvy. He started out as a tape operator at DECA, working for Gus Dudgeon and, and people like that. And he told me that he had engineered All Right Now by Free. And he was one of those kids that took apart radios and was a ham radio. He was born to be a recording engineer, you know? And so he, he didn't play a musical instrument, but he was, he was a, a recording man. And yeah. anything about mics or tape saturation that, so that it would compress right and sound great on the radio. And he knew all the stuff. And, uh, but at the same time, he was just going for a vibe. You know, he wasn't going for like this vacuum sealed, auto tuned, you know, suffocating perfection that you hear now where there's no air in the music. He was kind of like funky and cool in that way. We, we would do these immense vocal things the way like those huge, like good times roll, and you hear that thing explode. The way he would do it with us is Ben, Greg, and myself would stand at one mic, three of us, and we'd sing the bottom part of the chord all together in unison, maybe seven or eight times. Then he'd bounce that down to say a stereo track or to stereo, and then wipe those. And then we do the next part, same thing, three of us seven or eight times. So three, so it's like what, like 20, 21 voices say on each part, and then the third part, and if there was a fourth part. And he had the most uh, unusual recording machine that you never saw. It was a, a Stevens 40 track on two inch tape. So in the days before you could sync up two machines or get extra tracks or, you know, and after 16 track and all that was 24 and you had to really plan your recording. Uh, so you had enough empty tracks to do all your overdubs and so on. Roy had 40 tracks on two inch. And there was like three of these machines in the world. And if it broke down, John Stevens, the inventor had to fly to wherever Roy was in the world and fix it. And he'd had to come to air and work on it while we were doing our record. But anyway, so he had extra tracks. But so the way he would do the records is we would get a, get a basic track with, you know, like bass drums and some sort of rhythm instrument, whether it was a keyboard or a rhythm guitar, and and then put like a, a guide scratch vocal, not a keeper lead vocal, but just to know how it scans and where the holes are to fill and, you know, what the song, the shape of the song. Right. And then we'd go right, right into background vocals so that he would have as many empty tracks available as possible. And so we would do that almost the first thing after getting basics, so there was plenty of empty tracks. And then he could wipe all those overdubbing tracks and have like, like three tracks or whatever of the background vocals on three tracks, and then the other stuff. And so we'd get to like, with both producers, in fact, we'd get to the guitar parts, uh, because Mutt was similar that way in that, it was pre-digital, pre-pro tools, or as many tracks as you want. It was still like 
Heartbeat City was two two machines linked together, um, but it was still you know three m two inch tape you know. But um, what what was I saying? Uh, oh, I lost my train. Um, just uh, we're contrasting the the two you know producers oh, and the oh, production style, I'm and you sorry. were talking about how you yes. get vocals and then guitar. Right, and and. I know in, you were going to ask me in our discussions before we got together today about the process of coming up with some of these guitar solos. Yes. And, and this might be a good time to explain it because I've just taken you up to the up to the and background vocals and a scratch lead. And so what I would do at that point is I would have the engineer make me a cassette of that um of what, what what we had done so six songs hmm. and i over the course of days and because it took a while before we got to the guitars or just guitars it says my internet connection is unstable i don't know what the, anyway yeah you um, froze up for a second there but uh but you're you're good now so let's keep going okay so anyway um i would work on these solos and i chip away and chip away at it like i think to myself like how do i start it you know, and it, you know, and it, it, I would want it to have a shape, a beginning, a middle, and an end, like any kind of good story or a book or a movie. Everything has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has a shape to it. And with the guitar solo, one of the things I would try to do was come come up with a way, first of all, to take off after the take off from the lead vocal in some kind of way that made sense. And a lot of times, I would refer to the melody of the song. Um, like, a, like something like shake it up. I go, eh, 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 literally playing the melody for the second yeah. half of the solo before. So I, I would key off the melody and the, and the chord changes and just like find my first lick, find my, my in, intro of the solo and go from there and, and just add to it and add to it over the course of time while we were working on other tracks in the studio. Right. So that by the by the time we got to the guitars, I was very prepared. I had like written these solos. Um, for the most part, I would use the word written or composed. I didn't wing it, for the, a couple I did, but for the most part, the, these solos were composed and carefully did. And I, that's, how I, that's how I do it. I'd kind of sit in the hotel, because uh, we usually didn't record we were home. I'd be, be in a hotel room with a cassette machine and a guitar with, with no amp or a little battery amp. And I, I would just, you know, try to find my way in. And, and then as far as like constructing solos, you know, I, I, I would think of them, I kind of like use the same approach as like a jazz player would in that. And maybe it's, having gone to Berkeley College of Music, or maybe it's being, I, I love jazz anyway. But anyhow, even if it's a pop song or a rock song, I'll try to play through the changes and move with the chords. And, you know, I, I get compliments and comments and it's, I'm so flattered that people, you know, like my solos and find them in some ways different than other more standard rock guitar solos or whatever it may be, you know, you see, it's like a little George Harrison kind of thing. And, and so, you know, if you look at like most rock guitar solos, let's say it's a, like a, a rock and song in A, and most of the time guitarist will just sort of wail away in the key of A, right? Like, like blues, blues flavored licks in our pentatonic boxes that we refer back to, not always, but, you know, and even if the song goes to the four chord, they're just still really just wailing away in A. And I never really did that unless I wanted to, unless I wanted it to be static and wanted to play against the chord, but it was always a decision. It wasn't like I just noodle in the key of the song, if you see what I mean. And, and so playing through the chord changes that way, moving with the chords, I think gives my solos maybe a different sort of melodic contour than Absolutely. It, right, then it would have if I was just sort of doing sort of the typical rock thing and just kind of playing like blues, hard rock licks in the key of the song, which so many rock solos are. And some of them are great. I'm not 
It's not a criticism. I'm just describing my process. Right. And, you know, I am. And I, and I think that's a huge thing that, you know, differentiated you from a lot of the other solos that you would, that you would hear that uh, were, they weren't playing over the changes. And also there wasn't that compositional aspect to the solos, but the fact that you were during the recording process, you're, you're getting a rough tape, you know, of the, of the, of the tracking session. And then you're, you're, you're composing a solo. You're, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's very evident. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a YouTuber named Rick Beato who did a, uh, uh, I an saw entire, it. entire episode on on just what I needed, and yeah. uh, it, and it's wonderful to hear the the different different parts of the track, you know, vocals, guitar parts, uh, keyboard parts that are all you know taken, and you can hear them by themselves, and it's it's really interesting that uh, Beato is you know kind of dissecting your solo and showing how you're playing over you're playing the third of the note or, uh, over the changes. So whatever, you know, whatever chord it changes to, you you were playing, you know, emphasizing the third of whatever the, the various chords were. It was, and it adds a, a really and interesting. Know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. Right. You have to be careful with these Zoom things. I, I, I'm sorry about that. But I, I watched that uh, Rick's uh, video and it was it was great. It was, it was terrific. I loved it. Um, I never even like thought about it as like thirds, you know, he, w once he pointed it out, I realized it, but I think it's just like, kind of like typical of me to go for the unusual and, 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 and not like land on like, like, like just try to sing. That's something else I would do like to like, like different strategies for like solos and stuff like that. Like one thing I would do is sing a solo into a, into a cassette tape and try to figure out what I sang, because then you're not bound to the fretboard and your like patterns and your muscle memory, we always go to the same shapes. And, and so I would do that sometimes, just sing a solo. And then you're completely free, you know, and you could sing anything, whether you know how to then figure out how to play it on a guitar. Right. I would do that. Another thing I would do is uh, come up with a line, and then come up with a harmony to it, and then throw away the original line <laughs> and just play the <laughs> harmony. <Yeah. laughs> um, you know, just different kind of things to shuffle the deck. You know, because yeah. there's really. there's an aspect of uh, like if you if you take the solo to just what I needed, where it's like your your guitar solo almost sounds like a counter melody to the uh, that main keyboard part. You know, at times. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, that, you know, we we worked real hard on that stuff. Uh, and Greg and I work really closely together as far as being the two melodic instruments in the band uh, to create, you know, intros and, and, and hooks, little lines to weave through the song or some sort of hook that would repeat at the end of every chorus, you know, like, like a day tripper or, or something, you know, a hook, you know, right. you, you wait for it to come around. But all those thoughts, you know, having grown up on 60s AM radio, we were, very schooled in like construction of pop songs and what what we wanted to do and like what a great pop song was and how you put one together and what you know what are the elements of, of that yeah so and then if you move on to uh you know, my best friend's girl you get you know all of a sudden you get this mix of of pop and and rockabilly kind of almost you know kind of going through Beatles 65 there's a you know, filtered yeah. through that. There's a, a really great, yeah, it sounds like, Har some of it sounds like some of uh, Harrison, you know, playing on the Tennessean, you know, that era of his guitar playing when he was. It does. Playing. It's, yeah, yeah. I was thinking like, sort of like that George Harrison, Chet Atkins style, that George, yes. George, play, George playing like Chet Atkins. But also the lick is very reminiscent of I Will. Uh, yes. Yeah. Which, yeah. you know, well, and I, I'm I'm sure either consciously or subconsciously I I, I was thinking about that. Only the, the, the thing is is even though the it, it, let me grab a guitar here because yes please. is that okay? You know uh, the song is going. But the but the lick I'm going through 
um, one, six, two, five. Like, you know, I will, it's just. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm playing. And that's something that can be missed by guitarists trying to, you know, cover that part is that, you know, you're not just playing the, the one, four and five that you're actually, you know. No. And that's, yeah. and that's another thing that you, you know, is a jazz thing is a, 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 like a, the simplest version of what you'd call chord, chord substitution. Right. You know, instead of just playing one, four, two, one, four, five, I'm playing one, the relative minor, the C sharp minor. And then, uh, F sharp minor, the relative minor of the A, although the rest of the band's playing A, and then B. So that's another little little thing. Yeah. And then, so again, I'm, I'm guessing that's another solo that was, you know, com composed and, and was there any, you know, kind of, I, well, I guess there'd been the Stray Cats and other things that were going on. And I guess, well, this is, this is before that, but- oh, well uh, before. Yeah, well before. Uh, was there, uh, was there any, I guess there wasn't any kind of pushback with the rest of the band and having kind of a, a, a rockabilly solo. I mean, it's kind of a rockabilly song anyway. So, but. Uh, it's true. I mean, there's really nothing about that song that would suggest a rockabilly or a country flavored solo. Right. Yeah. Oh, now the guitar's working. Yeah, okay, I can hear so, the slap back now. So I'm going to get faster. Okay, and then see if I can play this damn thing. The solo has some really interesting elements in it where you're uh, bending, you know, like you have a sixth, you know, interval part that you, that you bend up. You have a part where you're, uh, when you're playing over the five chord, where you, uh, you know, bend up, you know, from the, from the ninth up to the, up to the third and you, uh, and you hit the tonic and the flat seven or, or there's just some, some really. Well, on, neat, the the yeah, on the solo? Yeah, on the solo. Yeah. Exact that part, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's beautiful, but yeah, that's it's so you know ear catching when all of a sudden you hear those sixths that are bent, and then you have that you know, where you're, you're, you're bending and, 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 and it's kind of a Jesse Ed, you know, thing where you're, uh, you're bending up and you're playing the tonic and then the flat seven on the, on oh, the, on the court. Yes. Yeah. That's also like a real Bakersfield thing. Yes. R Roy Nichols. You know, like, uh, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. It's like it's, it's that too. Yeah. Um, and it was like, it was the beginning, but not, Best friends girl, but me learning that stuff from Jesse Ed, it was like the beginning of people like playing like pedal steel licks on guitar. Okay. And yeah, even so like to the point, of, like even like the simple kind, like say Mick Taylor on Honky Tonk Women, you just like, <laughs> that kind of stuff, you know? Right. But um, I got into you. <laughs> You know, I so, so I'm guessing kind of Jesse Ed is kind of some of the entry into this because it's it's always you know it's it's always interesting when you hear someone from Long Island talking about 
you know, Merle Haggard and Bakersfield and things like that. So oh. how, how were you even exposed to that music? I mean, were there were there country stations in, in Long Island or where, how were you hearing this you know, this music? Well, we used to go to the Fillmore East and the Grateful Dead used to do Merle Haggard songs. Yes. Um, Mama Tried and things like that. And um, we loved James Burton. We, we, got, we got his first solo record and we started buying Merle Haggard records. And not even just like the ones with the chicken picking, but we loved like two of our favorites were the tribute to Bob Wills and the tribute to Jimmy Rogers, the one same train, different time. Yeah. And James Burton plays Dobro on that one. Yeah. But yeah, those, those the Bakersfield guys, Roy Nichols and, and Burton, Played those in like sevenths, in, you know, in unusual, you know, like, you know, they they play these, you know, like that, you know. Yes. And so that creeped into my playing too. And the other guy, you know, we talk about Jesse Ed and Sixth a lot. And the other guy on telly that had a big impact on me was in the R and B field was Cornell Dupree. Oh yeah. And you know, I mean, like the the six, you know, you like. <laughs> You know that kind of stuff. Um, you know, yeah, Memphis I got a lot from, Yeah, all that stuff, uh, and and his, you know, just his vibe. You know, um, I I learned a lot from Cornell. Um, he's another great one. You know, you know, I should probably circle back with you, Zach, because you know, I told, I, I told you how Roy's uh, production style was and I never really did the second half and right. talked about how Mark was different. Yes. So if you want to lay, lay it on us. I'm gonna lay it on you. So like like as I said, we thought like you know Roy was super technical and super exacting, which he was. And so and we did the first four records with Roy. And I think Rick more than anyone else in the band really was thinking about maybe trying a change. And uh, we met a few different producers. We ended up going with Mutt. And Mutt's style was like beyond like exacting. You know, he would wear out engineers where they'd be asleep under the board, you know, and, 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 and he had this incredible energy. He'd wake up at like five in the morning and meditate. And, and, and he worked us each to death and he would be there for each of us. Like for instance, I, I, I'd be playing solo and over and over and over again, and he'd keep going, oh, too bad, E, not, not quite the one. And I think I'd play a take and I'd think, I can't possibly play it any better than that. And he'd go, oh man, not quite the one. And what he was going for was a very hard thing to get. It was a like, contradictory thing. He wanted a perfect take that also sounded spontaneous, that you weren't thinking about it. Yeah. So it, it's not a hard thing to do, like after playing something a hundred times, he wanted that perfect take, but he also wanted it to sound like he just grabbed the guitar off the stand and played it off the top of your head. So that's one thing, he, it, you know, it was very unusual and I learned a lot. He also like really, he tightened me up as a, as a player on rhythm tracks. I, I got to where I was sort of living inside the hi-hat. You know, and just locking, just locking and locking. And he was so good about pocket and grooving. Um, he was funny. I mean, there were so many microphones on my guitar cabinet. It looked like one of those news conferences where all these mics had jammed in. There was You couldn't see the grill cloth. And he'd listen to all of them and, you know, try every kind of amp in the world. And, you know, he he, he just took a long time. That record took a year to make. And um, it went a million dollars over budget, over budget. That's how, that's how he was, he heard things that no one would hear. Like for instance, he had an unusual technique. His process was that he would do the basics with a, like a Lynn drum machine. And then we do the drums afterwards, which you would think would be counterintuitive. But it was clever because you could hear exactly where the tom fills were needed or where you needed a lift. And stuff, and that's how he liked to do it anyway. But he'd put this Lin, Lin drum thing on, and he'd go, he'd listen to it. It just sounded like a regular, dum, dum, bop, whatever. 
And he'd go, oh man, pity about that hi-hat, it's a little off. And he was criticizing the internal time of the Lindrum. And so he had this stack of AMS delay machines in the studio and he'd be moving the hi-hat and the snare drum back and forth a millisecond or two milliseconds, claiming that the Lindrum was off. Wow. Things we couldn't hear. He claimed Ben's bass was fretted, misfretted wrong and couldn't play in tune. And Ben had a, it, he had to find a luthier in London and refret his bass. I, can't, I, I, I couldn't overstress how painstaking and how, uh, you know, how particular he was about every little thing. So it... <laughs> Without and trying to, you know, you got great results. Yeah. The, all the other thing about my the background vocals is, you know, it was oh, we, 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 Greg and Ben and me were we were the singing background brothers, Amos, Leaf, and Denton. That's what it was our names. <laughs> we do that every record. Um, we were potheads. What can I say? But um, Mutt would join us on the mic. And you can always hear Mutt when he's singing. You can hear him on the Def Leppard record. You can, hello, hello. You can, it, it's like the same thing you hear on, on Def Leppard records. Yes. You hear his voice. It's hilarious. Um, but, you know, the results were amazing. We had, you know, Drive, You Might Think, or Magic, uh, you know, a bunch of, you know, sing hits off that record. and it was probably the most successful record since the first one, I think, you know, in terms of so many singles coming off of it. Yeah. Without, <clears throat> without putting words in your mouth, it, it sounds like that the, 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 the Mutt production was, it was a little bit rough and that's from the only other guitarist I've interviewed so far that worked with Mutt was uh, Brent Mason on the Shania Twain records. And he was respectful, but just said how, how tiring it was and how hard it was. He had me tuning after every take. And I just mean like a couple of notes, you know, a little punch in, you know, check the tuning. And one day I got so mad, I took, I took the guitar off my lap and I said, here, Mutt, you tune it. I can't take it anymore. And um, I remember another moment, like, like there were things like, 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 like David, was like really upset with the way the drums were being done. And, you know, people were ready to go home. Yeah. Because like Mutt was so controlling and like was gonna, and it, it, he wasn't gonna back down Mutt. It wasn't like, oh, the drummer in the band doesn't agree with me, I better go with the guy in the band, no. Um, you know, we had to push back when he tried to write with us, you know, because Rick doesn't, Rick don't need nobody writing with him. And, you know, it's like, no, thank you, okay, man. You know, but that, because that's what he did with Def Leppard. Right. Know? He was a member of the band in the, in the studio. You know, he was more or less. And he would take their songs apart and put them back together like a chorus from, like he'd use like them like building blocks, like put this chorus with that verse and take and, and mix and match and write with them. And, they, you know, cause he started with them and they were kids. They were younger. And, uh, and and it was great, you know, and they trusted him and he, he, look what he did for them. But we didn't need all that kind of help. That wasn't the kind of help we were looking for. We just wanted a great producer and a great sounding record. Yeah. But his contributions, you know, you can hear his contributions just in the difference of the way the record sounds. Because other than that, it's just the same five knuckleheads playing. <laughs> <laughs> so who's... Uh... Was it a unanimous decision to to want to work with Mutt, or did any of, did did you have reservations? No, no, there was no. It wasn't like a huge uh, discussion anyway. I mean, was like, who who's going to say no if Mutt Lang wants to produce your record at that moment in time? Right. Why would in eighty three? You know, it was like going from the best to the best. You know, in seventy seven when we made the first record. Roy Thomas Baker was state of the art. And in 83, when we went back to England to make Heartbeat City, Mont Lang was state of the art. Yeah. And we were, and, and, the, and the cars were always uh, tried to stay on, uh, right on the cutting edge of the newest technology, especially Greg, our keyboard player. 
um, you know, got a synclavier or early on, and 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 David Robinson with his syn the syndromes, you know, like let the good times doom, doom. Right. right. You want to hear a cool story about that? Yes. I watched Roy Thomas Baker invent triggering. There was no. <laughs> Well, Sam, check this out. There was no, no, no Akai, nothing like that then. David played his real rack tom on the song. Just let the good time boom. Then Roy fed that track through a small little wooden oratone speaker. And for those listening who don't know what that means, Almost every recording studio would have this little oratone speaker in their studio to check what mono sounded like and to hear what it would sound like on a car radio. It was sort of like a crummy little speaker, but it was very typical. And you could, it was good to check your mix on that because it had to sound good on that too. Right. So what Roy did, he turned it on its back, that little oratone speaker, so that the cone was facing up. Then he took the syndrome pad. It was like a drum pad, electronic, that you'd hit. He turned it down on top of the cone, and he fed that tom-tom track through the oratone speaker loud. And it was loud enough that it would punch the syndrome and make it go boom, boom, every time David hit his tom on the recording. And it triggered it. Right. <laughs> How about that? Again, I mean, from his engineering it, background, yeah. So, so good, you know. He, he would try anything if it meant putting a mic at the end of a, a mailing tube, anything, you know, to try different stuff. And, um, you know, he had, he was so, he's so brilliant and such a clever man. And he thought about it for a minute. How could we do this? And he figured it out. And it was so funny you know, with the speaker upside down and the thing, and lo and behold, it sounded perfect. You know? Wow. So also, uh, kind of backing up to the first album, and you all had, had done demos of the songs before you started working with Roy, and then you work with Roy, and you get all those uh, you know stacked background vocals. Was yeah. it uh, was it stressful, or uh, how did you feel when you were trying to reproduce those sounds live with all those background vocals? Well, we couldn't. Yeah, we. It's impossible to. And so, you know, we would try different things, you know, when the Eventide Harmonizer came out and we would try feeding the background vocals through anything to thicken them or maybe a little bit of chorusing or stuff like that. But no, I mean, you know, we, we, could, we, we couldn't replicate them. Yeah. Later on, um, you know, there were things that wouldn't have even been producible on stage um, with Mutt that the, the, what, we, what we did, Greg had a synclavier keyboard, which is a sampling keyboard. So for something like the song, Hello Again, which we would start our show with that year, because it's a great way to start a show, Hello Again, we're back. And it has backwards reverb, hello, hello again, you know? Yes. So how are we gonna, you know, in those days, how are we gonna put backwards reverb on something live in a basketball arena? So Greg lifted that off the master and put it on the synclavier. So he'd press a key and it would play that intro. Right. Things like that. So later on, you know, so it made it just possible to even play the song, you know, because more and more, especially by that record, a lot of songs were on a clock. Whereas before, if I wanted to, you know, in a lot of songs, I, I had areas where I could take the solo out a little longer spaces I could stretch out. But if the song's on a clock and you do that, you're gonna keep playing and the song's gonna end. So you can't, right. you, it's gotta be the same amount of bars every time. So that's another, that was a, another aspect of the Mutt thing. It kind of locked us into these machines. <laughs> in a way. It was just the times, you know, it's not like a bad thing, but it was just like, that's what was going on that year, you know? Yeah. What could we... And of course, you, you going from you know from touring on the first record to touring on the on heartbeat city you had very different uh, guitar rigs what what would you say was your favorite guitar rig from your 80s touring era with the cars you know when you've got all that production and everything yeah 
you know, I went through a lot of different stuff where finally I had one of those giant uh, Bradshaw racks. Right. You know, with everything in it. Where now, you know, it's all multi-effects, but then each box would do one thing. So you had to have the big T, you know, TC2290 and the spatial expander just for the chorus. And, you know, and now, you know, once the SPX90 came out, it, it changed everything because you had multi-effect and you could do with one half rack space what you needed a refrigerator to do before. Right. So I, I wasn't that crazy about that, not because it didn't sound good, but it was so complex, I, I couldn't even turn it on without a tech. Mm. Basically, I think my favorite was just a couple of Marshall JCM 800s and some Boss pedals. And um, and I had a, I could turn on uh, a, a Harman, an Eventide harmonizer to get that sort of tunnel tubular effect when I was going to do, say, so, a, the solo in Since You're Gone, that one that kind of sounds like an Ebo but isn't. Yeah. Uh, and, and part of the sound was that harmony. So I kicked that in. But very simple, just a, you know, a bunch of boss pedals or pedals and, and a couple of Marshall JCM 800s. I'm good to go. That's, yeah. a, that's a good rig. <laughs> yeah, it's a good rig, you know. I take a bunch of guitars out with me and, you know, had the luxury of a tech that could hand them to me and tune and everything. And so I would take, you know, 12, 14 guitars out with me and have some fun. If I was in the change moods, you know, somewhere in the tour, I felt like playing different guitar all night and I might do that, you know, and just to break up the monotony and stuff. And so that was all great. Yeah, because, you know, there's an aspect of, you know, you change guitars uh, for a different sound. And some people change yep. it for a you know change of wardrobe, or sometimes they change guitars as an opportunity to talk to their tech and and say you know I, I don't like this you know change this out or what have you. So right, right. What was the case with you? With uh, did you did you like to change guitars just for, kind of for the fun of it, or did you did you prefer to to hold on to a guitar as long as it was you know kind of uh, you know do, doing its job well, and then you'd change out you know. More, more of that, more of the second one, more of the latter. You know, if, if something was really working and the neck feels great and it's set up great and it's low, but it's not rattling and it's just, you know, working for you, I would tend to leave it alone. You yeah. know, I'd always, I play, you know, most of, most of a car is set on like a humbucking guitar, whether it was a Gibson or for a year there, I played the Deans or whatever it would be. But most of the show is like a you know, Les Paul. Or, or, or I played 355 monos sometimes too, other guitars. And then I'd always, of course, switch to a Telecaster for Best Friends Girl and uh, a couple other songs that, that were like that, that, you know, had a different sound on it. Um, and then, you know, just, I'd have extra ones, just, you know, you have backups and then I would keep a couple, just if I got in the, you know, a couple of wild cards, if I just felt like, playing a junior all night and just like having to get it all done with two knobs and one pickup. And I'd enjoy that and, and, yeah. and find a whole world there, you know, of tone. Yeah. There's yeah. Uh, there's, there's clips of you playing a red junior with a white pick guard and uh, yeah. you even play like, uh, yeah, best friend's girl. And you, you play a, a, a lot of that, uh, that live show on, on that one guitar. And it's, it sounds right. great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people, you know, may go, and myself included, make such a fuss about which guitar, which amp, and this or that. But but there you have it. I mean, I, I can play Best Friends Girl on a Les Paul Jr. Like it's like almost counterintuitive from like the, a twangy Telecaster, and it sounds fine, you know. Good. So, you know, it, it, I hate the cliches like the tones in your fingers and all this goofy stuff. But on some level, it's kind of true. Like you know. I really think like your vibrato is your fingerprint. You know, maybe your 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 tone is like you know, like you know what you want to say, but like your vibrato is who you are. It's like your nervous system. Yeah, it's it's your signature. You know, it is, and 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 the other thing I think about that is that like, I think people have like their own built-in speed that they go at, where People who can shred 
can almost do that after playing for six months. And it's not because they're more talented, it's because, or anything else, or they practiced harder. I could practice from now until doomsday and I would never be a shredder. It's because of the speed at which their nervous system goes. For instance, you know, some people talk in a slow, lazy, laconic way. And some people talk real fast. And, blah, blah, blah. and I think it's the way you're wired. You have a speed you go at and, and what feels comfortable to you. And, and I think that really is a, a big part of like, you know, like there's so much emphasis on how fast you can play. But I think a lot of it is you can only play as fast as you can play because that's how fast you run. And your internal engine, yeah. I, I, I believe there's, you know, you know, I'm, I know that, you know, hours and hours of practice, you can improve and, and, and improve your, you know, dexterity and speed and stuff like that. But I think at the end of the day, you are who you are and, and you hear things the way you do and feel them the way you do. And I think it's a lot is, is like encoded in your, your genetic code, you know? Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we had, uh, Talk about the the early, you know, the Fender Custom Shop, and you kind of you had an association with Fender. I guess you know, also in the in the eighties, you know, Strats were kind of you know king to a degree, but uh, mm. you you kind of started an association with Fender with the the lead series, and then uh, then when the Custom Shop came on, you uh, you were one of the early customers for that. Tell us about your association with Fender. Okay, just put this to try that. Actually. Um, I got the two custom shop guitars out. I can show show them to, yeah, to the audience. Like, please. Um, I'll just pick one up while I'm telling the story so you can see it while I'm talking. Yeah. I don't know if you can see, can you see me? Yes, I can see you. You're small, but I can see you. The guitar is in a lizard skin aqua case. Nice. Aqua lizard toenails. <laughs> but anyway, um, this is um, this is the first custom shop Fender guitar built for an artist. It is number triple oh seven, and I don't know if you can see John Page's signature on there. Yes, you can see the the early stamp that uh, that they put on with the with the 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 builder's yeah. signature. Yes. I got the James Bond, not 007, but 007. Yes. And it, it's a, it's a, uh, a left-handed thin line seafoam green with a beautifully bird's eyed neck. Yes. So what happened with the whole custom shop thing was I, I went down for the first time uh, to, to Fender and they were still in, uh, in Fullerton. It was still like the Fender factory. They hadn't moved to the Corona or anything like that. Right. Of course not. The custom shop, and um, and I, I I met a gentleman there named John Page, and we you know you meet some people in your life and you just instantly friends and you just click. We just liked each other right away, and he had, he was new there, and he was working and Freddie Tavares was working there still with him. Wow, talk the about connection to the the, the the early days. He helped to design the Stratocaster, as you know, as many people know. And Freddie was awesome. He was like this beautiful Hawaiian guy who he 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 go get jump on the floor and do marine push-ups and clap his hands. And he'd set my guitars up for me. And Freddie Tavares is like shimming my neck, you know. Yeah. Awesome. So I went down there in 79 uh, to meet with them, and they had this new model, the lead. And they asked me if I would play it and help them promote it. And I said I would. And so they made me uh, two left-handed ones, the lead one and the lead two. Later I had what we, we called jokingly a lead one and a half, which was a lead one with a lead two neck pickup, which mm -hmm. is more versatile than two pickup guitar. And um, particularly the lead one was a great guitar. I wish I still had it. It's hanging up at a hard rock cafe somewhere. But, um, it had this really unique humbucking pickup that you could you could do series, parallel, split. It had like two toggle switches on just one pickup. You know, so it, it got a lot of sounds out of it. And so I played that guitar and 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 
you know, from there it grew to, you know, asking John, hey, can you build me this or that? And it got to, the, then it, it, it went, you know, and, it, and he was trying to get all this stuff done without a custom shop, you know, when it was just a production line. And I'd call him and say, John, we, we need to send a pink guitars for a video. Uh, you know, I played a pink Stratocaster and Shake It Up video and Ben got a pink precision bass. You don't see Greg's, but Greg got a pink Telecaster custom with binding. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and, and, and then another time I called John and I wanted a Telecaster custom, just a regular sunburst rosewood neck one with binding. I said, but can you put like the little thin black white stripes like on a, like a more fancy guitar on the inside of the binding, like a Les Paul custom, you know, to make the binding stand out with that black stripes there. Yeah. And they kind of highlight it. And he'd like, oh, geez, okay. And he'd make three bodies, you know, five to make sure one came out right. And so finally, and he, he kind of like gives me some blame or credit or how, whatever you want to call it for starting the custom shop. He said to me, you know, Elliot, he goes, one of the reasons I started the custom shop is because you kept asking me to make stuff we don't build. And, 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 and so it occurred to him, you know, and he was probably you know, getting, I'm sure I wasn't the only one. And so artists were calling us, you know, can you do more like an old one and this and that from there, you started seeing like the reissues, uh, you know, the, the 57 uh, Strat and the 62 Strat and the, 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 the Blackguard Telecaster, the Butterscotch right. Tele came out. And then slowly the custom shop got going. And so this guitar, you know, there were six guitars before it, but they were pre-ordered by a music store in Texas, I believe. And um, I was the first artist to order one because I was talking to John all the time and he goes, Hey, you're gonna like this. I can finally build you whatever you want. And um, you know, we have a custom shop now. So I, so I ordered this crazy thin line with, and I ordered a, a Mary Kay Strat, which I can grab that one. You wanna see that one? Please. While I, while I tell the story? Yeah. All right, this is 0008. And this one is in a snakeskin Torex case. See, I, I <laughs> love that. I love that attention to detail where they gave you, you know, really one of a kind cases. And oh my goodness, that's beautiful. That's how it was then. Yeah. That's how it was. I, I have like an, another case. It's like maroon eel skin Torex with white leather. Well, you know, the cases were beautiful even. Yeah. This is the very, very beginning. So this is um, number eight. The, 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 the telly is number seven. This is number eight. Mary Kay Strat, gold, gold hardware, blonde finish. And again, it's number eight, triple O eight. So these, these were the first two. And, um, in the, I think in the Fender, in one of the Fender books, and I think there's a book called, just a custom shop book, there's a photo of um, John Page and, and Michael Stevens with that Seafoam Telecaster on, on, a, on the bench. And they're like discussing it and working on it and talking about it. Yeah. And so it's nice to be a little part of the Fender history that way. It's really, mm -hmm. really cool. I remember a Guitar World, you know, article on the uh, on the birth of the the custom, you know, the Fender Custom Shop, and they had some pictures, and there were a couple of left-handed tellies that they were making for you. <laughs> One of them was even a, a, like a rosewood board with a white pick guard, you know, that was, you know, it's like they mm -hmm. you were you were having a couple couple of tellies made up. I guess you had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> it, it was like you know, opening up the gates of heaven to say to me. As a lefty, you can get whatever you want because you know, as a left-handed player, if you walk into a, a guitar store, you usually see like maybe a black Strat American Standard and a, and you know maybe a, a, a Les Paul Standard or an Epiphone Les Paul. And that's about it. Yeah. So to be to be as guitar crazy as I am, to know all, all that we all know about guitars and vintage guitars and all the rest, 
I knew what to ask for. You know, I, one thing I could do is spec out a guitar. And right. so once he said, once he said, you know, we can do it now. I, I just had a lot of fun with it. I really did. I drive down there once I moved to LA, leave six in the morning and beat traffic and go down to the custom shop and meet with those guys and have lunch with them. And we really became friends, you know, it was really good times. Great. So, and then uh, on vintage guitars, you know, of course you've, you know, you already talked about the Burgundy Mist. So of course, but even with vintage guitars, you have a, a much more, you know, limited uh, stock of even vintage stuff that's hard to track down. So what are some of the more interesting left-handed vintage guitars that you've tracked down? Well, uh, not not as many as a, as a right-handed person would be able to, but no complaints. Yeah. Um, I currently, a uh, vintage ones I have, um, I have a 1965 Trini Lopez um, uh, rock and roll one, the, the 335 one, the right. Kessel. Yeah. Um, I have a 62 Barney Kessel with PAFs, first year issue in a brown and pink case with the, the rare laminated spruce top wow. instead, of pressed maple, instead of the pressed maple. Yeah. And it's the best jazz guitar. It's got the wide flat 61 SG Les Paul neck okay. that 61 62 neck right it, which is my favorite that's my favorite gibson neck and uh the pencil has that let's see i've got a beautiful uh 66 jazz master of that weird rare variation from 66 where it has dots but binding yes you know yes and actually has large frets because you know what I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Yeah, I've I've played some uh, some '66s, you know, Tellys, Strats, and Jazzmasters. That all of them had like, I was like, has this been refretted? And then no, you know, and then they haven't, but they that. they had some big frets for a while. They ran out of guitar frets, and for a couple of weeks or months, they used the bass frets. <laughs> well, that explains it. We <laughs> can't couldn't stop the line for a fret, so exactly. it was a different one. Yeah. Just a different wine. That's all. Yeah, and the, but, uh, and, the, and the dots with the with the binding is really a beautiful look. That that yeah, that was yeah. only for like a year and a half or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I have that isn't really popular with collectors, but I've always loved them probably because I grew up, you know, looking at the '68 catalog and stuff, and and that the Fender, you know, like gallery of stars was the the Roger Ross Meisel designed acoustics. Yes. I would always, my whole life, I, if I could have could have ever come across a Wildwood Kingman, I would grab it in a second. I have a lefty Malibu, and yes. I have a lefty, mm -hmm, the, the smaller one, and, uh, and I have a lefty 68 Villager 12 string. But I, <laughs> I, I, I would have loved to come across the Dreadnought. And they're not popular, you know, with, with players and you know, some of them have that pipe and running down the body and stuff like that. They're a little weird, but I like the Malibu and I'll, I'll string it like Nashville high strung sometimes and take it in the studio and play it. It's good for that, you know, and it's got the electric neck. It's so easy to play. I just think, I, you know, I've, I've had so many vintage guitars. I had a, I had a 54 Les Paul left-handed that I traded Bunny Carlos from Cheap Trick, the drummer for, um, He's left-handed too, and he liked to collect guitars. And so we were we were near them, and they came to our show wherever we were playing, Chicago maybe, or near Rockford or something. And um, I, I I had a, a, a 63 Candy Apple Lefty Strat, the matching headstock, and he wanted that. And he had two gold top Les Pauls. And he brought them both to the show, and Rick was with him, and Rick looked over my guitar to make sure that it was a good fair trade. And we just swapped even. And so I, I got the 54 uh, Les Paul, which I played on stage quite a bit around, around 82. There's a lot of pictures of me wearing like this Japanese flag, red and white shirt playing this gold top. It was either playing that or this cherry 355 mono that I used to like to play a lot. Yes. And um, um, I, I had a 63, 335. Um, lots of strats. I had a 59 Rosewood lefty, like first year of Rosewood, uh, a 58 Telecaster mint. 
um, a 66 Fender electric 12 string, very rare with the hockey stick headstock. Yeah. Um, I had a, a 46 Martin triple 028. All kinds of all kinds of good stuff. Oh, yeah. I had an Epiphone. I had a twelve string Epiphone Bard from the sixties, which is like the B forty five twelve. Right, you know, right. The Epiphone yeah. version I had one of those. I think I paid six hundred bucks for it. You know, all kind. It wasn't. You know, the, when when we were acquiring a lot of these vintage guitars, the prices weren't what they are now. Right. They were not like what they are now. I could have had. The only left-handed Firebird 7, uh, 65, for $1,400. And instead, the guy also had an L-series left-handed Lake Placid Blue Telecaster. And I got that for $650. And then Freddie Tavares, Freddie Tavares set it up for me and, and put the neck on right and shimmed it and made it play good for me. So lots of, lots of great ones, lots of good stuff. Yeah. So, hey, can I show you my, I, I got this new guitar, this Blue Les Paul. Yes, absolutely. I, yes, I, I definitely want, want to look at that because it was kind of 64 inspired. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's like a concept guitar. Yes. And, you know, the, the folks out, my, the, you know, your, your, your fans might enjoy me sharing this. So let me, absolutely. right here, I'm just going to step away for a second and grab it. Get it. I'm going to get it. Step on the wall here. So again, this this was kind of in, inspired by you know what if, what if the Les Paul had had the the normal single cutaway you know Les Paul standard had continued to be in the line going into uh, you know sixty four or so and so then you have this really cool Pelham blue a uh, tiki god uh, headstock inlay and the Double stingers. Sting double stingers the heel yeah. too yeah and it's it's light as a feather and it's not chambered yeah so yeah it, the, the, you you said it I, the, my concept was if the les paul wasn't discontinued in 1960 what might a 64 les paul be like yeah and so i i went right to the firebird color wheel chart of custom colors i thought okay They'd probably be a, be painting them in flashier colors, and I went to the, the the black knobs, which made me think of black plastic parts instead of the cream on a '50s guitar, and um, going with um, Pelham Blue, one of the Firebird custom colors, and um, you know uh, nylon bridge saddles, and, and you know so it's like a concept guitar. Um, and then, and then I, you know, to personalize it, to make it my own, my own kind of thing, I put my little tiki, there's a tiki inlaid on the headstock instead of the usual Les Paul silkscreen right. signal. Yeah. Uh, I, I love the, the touches on that. It, you know, the, uh, yeah, the, the color and then the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the black, you know, the black knobs that I, or are those called top hats? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. Or reflector, with the, with the, or, yeah. Reflector, right, with the silver inserts. Yeah. But this thing, well, let me turn the amp down a little bit. But, um, What all did you have going on on, on there? What, I'll tell you what. Um, I, I, I mostly when I get a new Gibson uh, custom shop guitar, 
I, I sent it down to RS Guitar Works in, in Kentucky. Yes. Uh, to Roy, Roy Bowen down there. And I have it, I have a, he has a special uh, Lindy Fralin pickup that Lindy makes just for him called the True 60. And it's based on Lindy's, the best sounding set of PAFs, these 1960 PAFs. And so I always put those in and Tone Pro's hardware. So everything's locked down good and tight and got the nicer gear ratio tuners and um, 50, you know, 50s wiring, Jensen oil and paper caps. And just, you know, he, Roy does all the gut, guts and uh, sets it up for me. And then I feel like I'm ready to go do battle with it. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's op- optimized. Yeah, exactly. What, what were you running through as far as uh, effects through the through the amp? What were you What were you running through? Just now. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm running through um, an, an MXR reverb, uh, a Dunlop Echoplex pedal. Mm-hmm. Um, my my distortion is coming from uh, an MI Audio Crunchbox. Okay. Which is my, okay. my favorite distortion pedal. It's called the Distortion uh, Plus, I think. No, it's called the Crunch Box. Yeah. Distortion Plus was sorry. Sorry, yeah. brain fog. Yeah. Um, so I use that and I use it, I use Alpha Me to Zen Drive for my uh, crunch. So in fact, if you if you want, I'll just take the computer for a second and show you the board. Sure. If you'd like to see. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So I've got a, a Keeley 30 millisecond on there for doubling and the Django box for compression and the Roto Choir from Tech 21 is my Leslie. Got a decimator on there for hum. And then this little loop that I can switch between the Zen drive and the distortion without having to turn one on and another one off, or I can just switch them out of the loop with the other button. So it's just like, you know, uh, one touch operation. Perfect. And then, oh, and then the two mini pedals are a mini wah and a mini volume. That's, a That's about it. Little nice buffer. Board. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great little board and just, you know, it's it's perfect. You know, I have a big board with more sort of atmospherics and, and, and ambient kind of stuff available to me. Uh, but this is like, you know, my main board that I use most everything. Yeah. So I get, you know, just on the, on the subject of, of, of gear, uh, you know, what, what gauge strings do you tend to use on guitars? Do you switch them out depending on the scale length or anything, or do you use kind of the same? I do. Yeah. No, I, I, I do. I, I've been having a little bit of issues with my, my thumbs and stuff. Uh, you know, I'm 67 now. Yeah. And I, 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 I like a nice, easy playing guitar. So I, I previously I'd, I'd always strung, you know, get, my Gibson, like solid bodies, not jazz guitar, but you know, regular, like Les Pauls with tens, and um, and even Fenders. But lately, I've been using nine point fives on the Gibson and nines on the Fenders, and yep. just that little bit. I actually like the way lighter strings sound on a Telecaster in some yep. ways. They, like they sound different, and when you want that little slappy Bakersfield thing, I think James Burton uses like eights, you know. Yeah, like people can't even play. Like people talk of picking up his guitar and they can't play it, you know. Right. There's always those kind of stories, you know. Yeah. So, um, because he has like a twelve for a G string. Yeah. Well, he was the he was the guy who came up with taking a set of strings, throwing away the low E before rock and roll light sets were made. That's right. And moving it all down a string, and then putting a banjo light on for the high E. And the plain G string, so he could bend notes. And you know, we've all read the stories of like all the all of our British guitar heroes. He drove them crazy because they couldn't figure out how he was bending notes like that. Right. Until they learned that trick, because there was no Ernie Ball slinkies, there was no rock and roll strings. That you had a wound G, like you know Gibson Sonomatics or Black you know, Black Diamonds, whatever. Right. But um, you know, finally, like the Fender 150s came out and the Ernie Balls and stuff, and that was awesome you know they were out by the time i hmm. right i just a, a a curiosity uh there was kind of this switch over where most electric guitar strings were you know were pure nickel 
And then they kind of switched out and they started having hex cores and they started doing nickel plated yeah. steel and, and, and such. And that, that kind of, yeah, well, there were, there was kind of a transition that happened in the seventies and, and, and then into the eighties where, you know, string construction, you know, like the standard string yeah. set was starting to change. Uh, and stainless you, steel. Yeah. Did you pretty much use, you know, pure nickel or, or, or nickel plated or what, what were you using like back in the day? Do you even remember? <laughs> yeah. I've been endorsing Diodario since 1979. Oh, wow. And I use the, just Diodario XLs, nickel wound, not the pure nickels, not the, yeah. none of the weird one, not the New York balance yeah. tension or any of those, just regular right. good old Diodario tens. Yeah. You know, and, and on acoustics, you know, mediums or lights, depending on, you know, just their phosphor bronze, not yeah. any weird mixture. Or, it, you know, I, I know what you're saying. It's, it's like it, it, it goes in phases. Like I remember there was a period in the 70s where like guys like John Carruthers and, and at the same time when people were stripping their Fender guitars down to natural, they were putting brass parts Right. on on guitars, brass nuts and bra and i didn't like that at all i found it to be a, a tone sucking affair i you know i mean Ale you know alembic with you know was like influential and you know everything was like the best of the best and the best but honestly i found I, I didn't like it I, you know i didn't like that period so the, you know, it was that period where everybody like sanded their beautiful valuable jazz basses down to you know nothing you know what I mean? And, uh, yes. and, and, and I think it's, it's part of that same, you know, and so that period, you know, brass and then came, you know, the metal period and people were looking for brighter and brighter and brighter and more top and the stainless steel strings came out and uh, strings like that that were like designed to just be so cutting. Right, because you're trying to cut through all that that uh, amount of you know kind of saturation that you have to wow. have something that's bright when you have that much saturation going on. Right, to get any kind of definition, you need yeah. that edge. You need that 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 transient when you hit with the pick. Yeah. So yeah, you, I, I've seen those phases, you know, and then you know Slash kind of brought back the popularity of Les Paul, uh, you know, because. You know, I went through the whole super strat period where everyone wanted what right. what Ed, Ed played. May he rest in peace. Uh, and you know the the Floyd Rose period and and so on. In fact, that's a funny thing because that you referred to uh, the my Kramer signature model, which right. is the first my first signature model, and I had them do two versions. I mean, I I, I was the only one who could get them to do a, not a pointy ho hockey stick headstock for one right. thing and more traditional headstock and there was a there was a, 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 a there was a model uh, Elliot Pro 1 and Pro 2 and the second one was set up like a telecaster exactly had, yeah <laughs> and it was cool cuz it, you know, it had that early p base pick guard that went up the cutaway yes you know and uh, I, I like that i think i saw jeff beck had it on his orange um, jackson yes or one of the guitars you know and I'm like anyone else, you know, I'm influenced by, I see something cool. And so that was in my head. And I thought, let's do that pick guard, you know? And uh, so I had the telly version. And in fact, um, what, what's his name? Uh, Tom Anderson built the prototypes for those guitars. He was building prototypes for Kramer at that time. And he gave one of them to Mick Jagger, the one of the telly type ones. And Mick played it in, in, like on stage and in a video and stuff. He's got a black one. Right. And, uh, my dear friend Andy Babuk, who you know I play in the Empty Hearts with, but was also known for writing the Beatles gear book and the, the gear of the Rolling Stones. Yeah, amazing and, books. Yeah, yeah. And in the Stones one, I get because we're pals. He put the, a little picture of Mick playing that Kramer. Uh, so <laughs> just yeah. you know, we're, we're geeky stuff. Yeah, coming around. So. Interesting, you know, kind of after the after the cars, you were you know associated with some some other other groups like you did Credence Clearwater Revisited with some with some of the guys you know from the original band, and yeah. uh, and then you, you did the the new cars, but then mm -hmm. the original band minus Ben you know got back together and, and did yeah. an album and and got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and. Uh, 
it, yeah. it's so it's so rare when a band gets kind of a second act uh how did it how did it feel to to be able to get back with those guys and be able to kind of celebrate your accomplishments oh it felt great it felt great i mean we've we've been through so much together that it doesn't take a whole, you know a lot of time to get back into the groove like you never left of course but i was really happy you know for one thing that rick lived to 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 do the rock and roll hall of fame thing and for my own reasons too because there was a lot of healing that took place the week we were there we rehearsed for a week in cleveland and uh at the um, House of Blues was dark that week and they let us rehearse there. And, you know, the jokes and sitting having meals together and kind of like, you know, burying some old ghosts and things. The one thing I could say about the whole, I mean, the experience was incredible and it was a wonderful thing, but I was also happy that when Rick did sadly pass away, that I wasn't left with that feeling that I wish I could have talked to him one more time and some things I wanted to say and stuff. We kind of got a lot of that at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and got a lot of closure. You know, bands are families for good and bad, dysfunctional families, and there's good stuff and there's bad stuff. And it's not that anything terrible or any gossipy kind of stuff. It's just, you know, the mishigas that bands go through. And... Um, so it was really great in that way to like spend a week together after the we had nothing really to prove we're just hang you know doing this thing and having fun with it and and it was really great the new cars was was fantastic uh band we had todd rundgren singing the right <laughs> rhythm and prairie prince on drums and chasm sultan singing and playing bass so it, greg used to call it autopia because it was like the cars in Utopia together. Right. <laughs> but it was such a good live band, though, because those guys are monsters, you know. And, you know, a criticism that the original band got sometimes is that we weren't sometimes that great live, which I, I, don't, I don't really agree with that. I think we were great live, but, like, Rick was not comfortable on stage. He'd rather be writing songs in his basement or recording he wasn't comfortable, like, he wasn't one of those, hello, Cleveland, you know, are you ready to rock? He wasn't one of those guys, you know. Yeah. He was just a poet and, and a songwriter and, and a shy guy. And so he wouldn't talk between songs and say even maybe a thank you, maybe he'd say, you know. And so we were quirky that way. So with the new cars, it was kind of a different experience because Todd is the consummate showman and is all over that stage and talking and telling jokes and stories and stuff. So it was a little different that way. And, um, but it was a really good band. You know, Chasm has a, such a beautiful voice. He sang Drive and he did such a fantastic job with it. And Todd has a, has a, a, a history of playing other people's music as well as his own. You know, whether it's that walk down Abbey Road thing or playing in Ringo's All Star Band or whatever it may be. Right. He's comfortable playing other people's music. And he he really did justice to, to, to the cars stuff. He really he really brought it it was great, you know. So that was a lot of fun. Um a, a, a quick aside, uh Again, kind of uh, referencing back to the uh, the Rick Beato uh, kind of him dicing up uh, just what I needed. It was really interesting to hear Benjamin Orr's you know voice isolated. And I guess my question for you, having been there when it was recorded, was was that the way he was tracking the vocal? I mean, it just seems so exact. I mean, uh, you know, and. Uh, either that or on, or on drive, you know, was, the, I, I guess w without, uh, without asking, did the vocals have to be massaged much, much, or did he just have that e exact, you know, vocal sound down? He had that exact vocal sound. And I'm not saying that he would get everything in a take. He would punch in, you know, right. Fix a word, a word here or there, or maybe he'd sing it a few times and they'd comp one together. Um, and then even then fix one or two things when they got done with the comp. You know how that goes. Yeah. There's still some, still something to fix. We worked on them. But as far as the quality, the tone, 
uh, his instincts as a singer, his phrasing, the, the way he works a microphone, the way he can kind of like, you know, really like knows how to hit a mic and, and the breathiness and all the things that you make a great singer. Um, that comes from Ben. He's just a natural, gifted, great singer. Wow. Yeah, it was just so, so impressive to hear his vocals, you know, isolated and uh, his yeah. intonation and his phrasing was just breathtaking. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't, I mean, the first record, we only took 12 days to record it. Think wow. about that. Second. Yeah. We were, in, we were in England for 21 days. It took 12 days to record and nine days to mix because Roy insisted on only mixing one song a day because then his ears would go. Yeah. So, it was you know because it was basically our live set, and so we we were real prepared. We'd been playing those songs for the better part of a year, and ready to go in and and you know I did all those guitar parts on that first record, and I'm not making this up. On my mother's memory, I did them all in a day and a half. The whole album, wow. all the guitar parts. That's and very I was impressive. Sick. And I was sick too. I ate something weird in England, and I was like you know, spewing from both ends and, and I was green and yeah. I played <laughs> some, <laughs> that's fine. the truth. That's, yeah. that's the goddamn truth, man. Yeah. That's the truth. Of it. Yeah. It, it's, it, it was only in the last couple, you know, in the last decade or two that you started getting gastro pub and, and, uh, and other, other kinds of, you know, good food in England. No, no, no offense, but, uh, no, yeah. no, you no, know, it's funny. I mean, it, it, it's true. What you could always get good was Indian food. Right. Curry. Which, yeah. Yeah. But which was, you know, which was an acquired taste. And that was funny because Roy Thomas Baker took us to our first Indian restaurant. And I didn't know what anything was. And he ordered me a vindaloo. I thought it'd be really funny. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had just tried Szechuan for the first time. Growing up, we thought Chinese food was chow, chicken chow mein and spare ribs that were dyed red. We right. didn't know Hunan and Sichuan and spicy foods. And so we went to this little great place called the Agra in London because we went back because it was so good. But I, I mean, it smelled like dirty socks to me. I, didn't, I hadn't eaten Indian food before. And, uh, and Roy <laughs> orders me a chicken vindaloo. <laughs> and I took a bite of this thing and drank an entire water pitcher, one of those plastic water pitchers down. I never tasted anything. There wasn't anything that hot. I, it wasn't a matter of never tasted. There, I don't think there is anything as hot, you know, a pure capsicum or something. But, um, and he was just roaring with laughter. He thought that was very funny. But you could always get good Indian anyway. In, in You're right. In, you yeah. Know. <laughs> so one of one of the things that uh, I wanted to hit back on and. Uh, and, and this is because of some interaction that we had, you know, on social media. It was, uh, you know, I, I had posted something about Jesse Ed Davis. And, no. uh, and I, I said, you know, you took a little bit of an exception because I, I said something about him being unsung. And, and oh. you were absolutely right. You had been singing his praises in interviews, you know, you know, from the beginning. And so uh, had John and and so had John Lennon. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's so I figured he's pretty sung. You know. Yeah, yeah you're you're right. Yes. And John Lennon, John Lennon's first choice for guitar player, that's pretty good. That's you that. know, cuz Taj played the the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus, I'm sure you know. Right. Right. It's about the only video there is of that band. Yeah. Uh, ain't that a lot of love with the do 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 just like yep. give me some love. And anyway, so the Stones and Lennon, they all like loved Taj and Delaney and Barney and the band. It was that time, you know? And uh, and so when John came to LA and started making records, of course, you know, Jesse played on it. And, you know, the first thing people know from him was Doctor My Eyes, I guess. But um, I really got into him with Taj Mahal. Yeah. And I, I learned so much. I learned so much from him as a player. Uh, yeah, yeah. What what a great player, and and I'm glad that you uh, you know one, were one of the guys that continued to you know to sing his praises you know through the. I'll years. give you. An Let me grab a Telecaster. Sure. So, 
You, Zach, you're familiar with the Taj records, right? You know. Yes. With so, cuckoo and so, bacon so, fat, and yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so something like this. Say, what a, what a, what a wonderful lesson this is in arpeggiating and like a descending bass line or something like. simple but it's so beautiful it's so beautiful or like you know that that's such a lesson if you can play that word because there's so many ways that you will use that in your life on a on like a beatly kind of pop thing with like a descending bass line and arpeggio it was like a, a great lesson yeah. and, and i put the leslie pedal on because jesse would play through a real leslie Yes. Because there weren't any of like that back then. And uh, he'd take it on the road, you know, play live too. He'd have an amp and a Leslie. Um, but I, 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 you know, something like, you know. stuff from high school i haven't played it in you know 40 50 years but yeah i still remember well yeah. like the you know the solo on six days on the road that he does is such a, a beautiful introduction to like country guitar you know? yes <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> I think that that solo uh, has been a, a, a gateway drug for a lot of rock players into more country influence playing. And I've heard a lot of people I, mention I'd that say, song. I'd say, I would say it was for like some of the English, like famous guys too, like Mick Taylor. All of a sudden they started working they they went three frets down and started playing their blues runs in right. the major do the major you, just, all you had to do it you just had to move the move your blues riffs down three frets but yeah. um if you think about it like that kind of playing like on honky tonk women and that sort of like like sloppy groovy cool like rock with country kind of thing i think like it sounds to me like jesse only threw a les paul in an amp pad yeah well, there's one other, you know, interesting thing with, you know, some of the players that you, you mentioned, there was this kind of uh, confluence or uh, this weird in influence that was going in between Jesse Ed, maybe George Harrison, and and maybe, uh, you know, Robbie Robertson, where everyone, you know, kind of had the telly into a Leslie, and they were all kind mm. of experimenting with it, kind of like what you hear on, like the first... Uh, like the first band record, there's, you know, yeah. some of the stuff where uh, where Robbie's playing through a, a Leslie, but like at a really like slow speed. Like the beginning of Tears of Rage. Like yes, Tears of Rage. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. But I, I was just wondering if you had any kind of, you know, take on that, because it's 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 curious to hear, you know, them all kind of experimenting with this Telecaster into a Leslie thing. And I was wondering if, yeah. if you had any insight who you thought it started with. You know, was it George? Was it Jesse? Who was who was doing that first and started influencing the others on that? Um. That's a really good question. Who used the Leslie first? Jewel Aikens on the Birds and the Bees. Let me tell you that. <laughs> I, 
Hey, that's a fast Leslie. Now, yeah. I mean, my brain wants to say George Harrison because yeah. I got to think they probably tried it on Beatle records and stuff like that. But right. there was a mutual admiration society going on with those guys. Um, they and, and 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 Eric Clapton as well. Right. Was part of that. I would say, you know, switching from a Gibson to a Fender Stratocaster and playing a more American style of music and basically forming a band with Delaney and Bonnie's rhythm section certainly is another indicator of that sort of influence. He, you know, started playing more, more like Jesse, yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, 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 uh, and George switched to a Strat and found his voice on slide. But, um, they all loved each other. I think, you know, the, the, the Big Pink had a huge impact and also the first Delaney and Bonnie had a huge impact on the musicians in London at the time, like the Beatles and the Stones. They really loved it. And the whole thing of like, get back was part of the same thing that engendered music from Big Pink it was like a return after the psychedelic hangover of 67, Let's get rid of all the all the BS and all the backwards and crazy, and let's just get back to rootsy, good rock and music. And so the band come out, and it sounds like a, a group that a rock band from the Civil War, you know. Right. And, and, and everybody, and 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 those English guys just adored it. And um, and then also Creedence Clearwater Revival, you know, was, was another get back band. And there was a you know. Uh, and 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 these bands had a huge influence. Like like like, I don't think you'd have Elton John's Tumbleweed Connection without say Big Pink and absolutely, of, or something like Matthew Southern Comfort or, you know, um, uh, what's R Richard Thompson's band? Um, well, Fairport Convention. Right. You know, and, and so. The, like the band and uh, that American music that was coming out right then had a huge impact on some really influential people. And really that's to me what the Let It Be album is. It was originally called Get Back. The whole project was called Get Back. And it was to get back to your roots. It wasn't get back, get away from you or anything. It was to get back to, you know, after Sgt. Pepper and the White Album, let's get back. After the Revolution 9, let's get back. Right. And so... So, so, and that was the whole idea. We were gonna make a record without overdubs and just strip down record and sit and play. And I have, I don't know how many hours, like like seven gig worth of audio of the month that the Beatles spent in Twickenham Studios making Let It Be. <clears throat> and it's the Nagra tape machine that would record dialogue on a movie set. So it's all the arguments and all the jamming. And they try, they play a little bit of, George does anyway, To Kingdom Come off Big Pink. They play a little bit of Who Will Stop the Rain and wow. all kinds of really surprising things. And you can really see how they love that crop of American bands. They like the Credence and the band and stuff like that. You know, George started playing the Telecaster. <laughs> yeah. He got that, got the Rosewood Telly. Yeah. He never played a Telecaster before that that I know of. Um, Paul had an Esquire. But George, I don't think had any had a telly, and so anyway, so you know, it, it's all like one kind. Of, it was like a, a feeling, like after the. I I always felt like it was like, kind of like after like I call it like the, the psychedelic hangover, right? To kind of like you know get back and just play some 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 good rootsy rock and roll, and it seemed to have been like the influence at the time, and it was influencing each other to make a, sh a short story probably way too long. Well, the the. <laughs> to bring things around the empty hearts uh one it's of course you know you and the drummer from from blondie and the and the lead lead singer from the romantics and then andy the uh babuik is that is that how you say his last name babuik babuik okay yeah Who of course uh you know is is part of the band also and i, I think that's a, a a fun way in which you've been able to uh, kind of uh yeah, it, it because listening to those tracks, you can hear the Beatle influence, and you know which is very very evident. And then you even had Ringo, you know, play play on a track on your last record. Right, right. The, the album before that, we had Mac Ian McLaughlin playing keyboards. Right uh, on the whole record, which was 
wonderful. It was one of the last sessions I think he ever did. Rest in peace. And then, yeah, Ringo. And, and that happened in a really like kind of like cool, organic way. It wasn't, it was nothing like, hey, I wonder if we can get Ringo to play on our record or wouldn't it be great to have a Beatle? It was none of that. We recorded the song and while he wasn't like satisfied with it, he, he I don't use the word satisfied, but like Clem coming from punk rock, and you'll understand this, plays more on top of the beat. Right. He's more of a forward, more of a forward drummer. And Ringo is just behind the beat, almost late, like Al yes. Jackson. Well, fat with Charlie, Charlie what? And I think Wally thought to himself, man, I really wish we could have that Ringo feel on this song with the big Tom fills. And, and so Wally had, had toured with, with, with Ringo in the All-Star Band. So all he did was call him and ask him if he would do it. And I know him too, and, and Andy does. And he said yes. And so we, we did it the way you would imagine. We sent him files of the song and he had his assistant set it up and on his put his headphones on and sat down in his drum kit, put drums on it and sent it back. And there's Ringo on drums on our song. And, you know, I wish I could have been there while he did it, but that would have been impossible or cost prohibitive. But, um, but that's how it happened. You know, it was just, we wanted the Ringo feel. And while he goes, wait a minute, why don't we just ask Ringo? And no yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, how amazing yeah yeah you want, want that drummer so we call that drummer that's all it was yeah <laughs> wow well well elliot we've we've had a, a wonderful time and i i think we probably should yeah. uh bring you know clo close it out uh i'm so appreciative of of your time and uh, thank you for for taking the time to to tell us some of your story and getting to hear some insight and and just about how the your solos were put together and uh yeah great stories and uh oh, thank, thank you, you so much. yeah thank you so <laughs> much for for being part of this it was a, a huge treat so thank you well it was a treat for me too you you ask good questions and you're a great guy and good to talk to and i, I hope everybody enjoys watching this and be safe out there love you and uh, keep rocking. All right, thank you.